All right, shaggers. I've attempted to enhance a Porter Studio recording using my digital audio workstation. Have I succeeded? Should I have even tried? Let's find out. <laughs> In a world where digital recording is widespread and inexpensive, I mostly make videos about using obsolete multi-track cassette recorders. I have heard the view express that Porter Studio sound bad. Uh, they definitely sound different than digital recording technology in much the same way that a Super 8 film looks different to uh, what you would take with an iPhone. I subjectively find those differences charming, but actually all that cassette revival analog sexiness isn't the main reason that I use Porter Studios. For me, a door well stocked with VST plugins represents a dangerous rabbit hole of analysis paralysis. To elaborate, let's think about just one aspect of recording equalization. Dealing with EQ in a door, you're going to have maybe dozens of options available to you. And it's kind of like being in Tinder purgatory. You're swiping left and right and going on some awkward dates and some promising ones that fizzle out. And then you meet someone special and you go on holiday together and you move in together and you buy a dog together and you walk the dog in the park together. But then familiarity turns to contempt and you develop irreconcilable differences and you fight and you hurt and you break up, and you're back to square one, except now you're jaded with a drink problem. By contrast, EQ on a Porta Studio is like an arranged marriage. There is no hedonistic courtship period. The elders of Tascam's research and development department have selected your spouse for you, and if you don't like their crooked nose or taste in reality television, tough shit, suck it up. Now you can really focus on raising children or selecting a favourable life insurance policy or whatever the fuck it is adults do. For those sorts of reasons, I err on making as many decisions as I can about the sound within the analogue domain. However, sometimes, especially when I'm using a Porter Studio that has a very limited mixer, very limited, I will find that the flaws that are baked into the analog mix down are too much, even for my very forgiving standards. A case in point, which we will be looking at in today's video, is a black metal demo that I made on a Tascam Porter 03. The Porter 03 has no EQ or send effects facility, only pan and level controls. Even the equipment I recorded the demo with was very limited. Very limited. I used a pocket operator as the drum machine, an adapted telephone as a microphone, and a cheap digital pedal instead of an amplifier. While the genre might not be for everyone, the guitars and the vocals turned out pretty much the way I wanted them to, but the dynamic range of the vocals was much more varied than the dynamic range of the drum machine or guitars. This dynamic mismatch caused two problems when I came to balance the four tracks. First, I had to mix the vocals louder than I'd like to so the quietest passages wouldn't disappear behind the guitars. Secondly, the drum machine had to sit lower in the mix than I really wanted, so that the flabby and too loud kick drum sound which was baked into the monaural drum machine recording wouldn't fight for frequencies with the guitars. And as a whole, the mix lacked bass frequencies even by cassette standards. I'm going to document how I used VST plugins in the Digital Audio Workstation to work around the aforementioned flaws. If you're going to do something like this, uh, I do advise you to go in with a plan. Because although I've just given you a clear picture of what it is that I wanted to achieve, that's the power of hindsight speaking. I actually went into this process with a really woolly mindset, like, duh, I'll let people know that uh, VST plugins exist, duh. And as a result of that fogginess, I genuinely went through the entire process that I just roasted, where I put loads and loads of different EQ plugins on the tracks. Inevitably, I got frustrated with that, uh, so I soothed and distracted myself by browsing the internet, which is obviously something you can't do when you're just working on a Porter Studio. And by the time I'd had my fill of like cat memes or whatever, and I'd circled back to the door, I just decided to dick with the guitars, even though they already sounded good, because they were just there and the temptation not to do that was too much. It wasn't until I'd done an audio mix down of the changes and done an A-B comparison that I realised that 
half the changes I made were no better or actually sounded worse. And I could have spent that time writing a new tune. Instead, I was like languishing in this dial adjustment cul-de-sac. It just goes to show how easy it is to lose perspective when you've been examining really similar sounds for an extended period. Your ears get tired and you develop this kind of contempt and over-familiarity for your own music. Uh, like it's a roommate that you moved in and initially you were friends, but you've grown to despise their peccadillos and ticks. Doubt, cynicism about your own creativity starts to creep in and before you know it, your inner monologue's like, you can only polish a tard so much, bro. So yeah, I definitely uh, encourage you to have your objectives well laid out, your exits marked when you expose your music to the cornucopia of options that is the modern, well-stocked digital audio workstation. Anyway, let's go over into Nuendo, which happens to be the digital audio workstation I am most familiar with. I'll show you which plugins I used and let you hear how they changed the sound. And you can let me know in the comments whether you think that they actually made a positive difference or whether this entire process was a complete waste of time. Hey, so uh, here we are in Nuendo now. You may notice that I've got this uh, red mark on my head. If you're wondering, I'm not actually a married Hindu woman. It's not a bindi. It's just a very symmetrically placed bit of acne. This little shot here is out of sequence. I've been editing some of the other footage and I've realised though at the beginning of this sequence of me explaining what's happening in New Endo, I've given a kind of longish examples of the before and after version of this song. As I go through and demonstrate the plugins, I'm playing the same sort of short section of the song over and over again, which is a good thing to do in order to hear the difference in quality that the plugins are lending to the sound. Um, but it's not such a great thing for the sake of repetition. So just to let you know, towards the end of the video, there's going to be this extended bit where I play you sections of this song, both the original version which is the red file on the screen and the enhanced version which is the green version on the screen. Um, I will put timestamps in the description that will mean that you've got chapters appearing in the bar at the bottom of the video so you should be able to navigate to that if you just want to kind of hear the AP comparison on its own. I'll start off by playing you the original recording that I took from the stereo outputs of the Porta 03. Listen to what I ended up with. You can already see in the file that there's a lot more compression overall. Hopefully you're going to hear some more ambience. I hope that you're going to hear that the different parts of the drum kit are more distinguishable. In this newer version, then I, th I think what you're going to hear is that the vocals are still audible, but they're not quite so up front. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, if I'd been starting with a different sound source, um, maybe um, all the different electronic drum sounds on different tracks of a multi-track cassette recorder or you know, different tracks in a DAW, then I'd get a different drum balance than that. But I think that the uh, balance between the sounds is better. <laughs> Now 
There's a lot of that hi hat, but not the kick drum. Where's we have ended up? You can hear a lot more of that open hi hat sound, and um, the snare probably not as loud as I would mix it if I had my druthers, but definitely more audible than the start. So let's talk about how I got that different result. It's worth mentioning at this point that the Porto 03 that I recorded with. The heads are a little bit different, the magnetic heads, they're slightly shallower and I think that's perhaps what accounts for this lack of low end. I don't have an engineering explanation of that but I think that's probably true. Certainly I noticed that the mixer on that unit it doesn't sound so good. Some of them the mixers sound better or worse and the Porto 03 the mixer is a little bit nasty. It's also worth noting that when I made the recording on the Porto 03 I had DBX turned off. I just wanted to make it, this recording as nasty as possible and you'll see as I'm going through the plugins here I am not trying to compensate for that low fidelity aspect of having a tape recorder. I'm not trying to make the tape recording sound hi-fi. I'm just trying to get a better balance. A bit more low end, I suppose I'm cheating on that aspect of it. So what I did is I took the tape out and I put it in my Tascam 44 Mark III. Set the speed control on that to the lower of two speeds. That's one and seven eighth inches per second, which is like commercial tape speed. Same you'd have in your car stereo in like the early 90s or whatever and the reason that I've put it in that Porta Studio rather than the original Porta 03 is that the 44 Mark III has four tape output so that allows me to capture four monaural wave file stems so I can process the four strands of audio separately and in my case I've uh, captured them with my Zoom this is the H6 I think but anything that had four inputs would work Obviously you could take your Porta Studio to a four input sound card attached to um, a computer and capture it that way. I just tend to find it's convenient to have this because I can take it to the Porta Studio rather than taking the Porta Studio to my desktop computer. The tape outputs of the 424 Mark III are bypassing the mixer altogether so that's not contributing to the sound in any way. Up here this first track is the Teenage Engineering Pocket Operator, it's the tonic. This is how it sounds, you can hear quite a bit of noise. And it's funny on its own it sounds like that kick drum's really strident but then when we are listening back to it, you can hear that in the mix, or at least at the level, I kind of baked it in to that um, original stereo file that was coming out of the stereo output of the Porto 03. It's really just the hi-hat that pokes through. So what I've done is I've duplicated that. So I'll just mute that all together. I've made one copy that's called snare and one that's called kick drum and I've processed them separately. So here's the one that I'm calling snare, actually. It's kind of the high end. And here's the kick drum, or low end really. It is just low end thump. And you put them together. If you compare that to Pretty different effect. Let's have a look at how I'm achieving that. So on this first channel labeled snare, but like I say, it's more like high end. I'm applying EQ and I suppose if I thought it through properly I would be using a six band EQ rather than a four band then a two band. It's just that I start with a four band EQ thinking that that would be enough and then needed this one as well. So you can see that the second one, the two band EQ, all I've got on it is a little three decibel pull down at 6000 hertz. I think that's to try and take the hi-hat out of it. it? Yeah, so it's just softening the hi-hat sound. I mean, it's catching the attack of the kick drum, but it's mostly emphasizing the snare sound and changing the hi-hat sound. Whereas this channel labeled kick drum, 
Here I'm cutting out the high end, so I've got this starting about uh, 700 hertz, and I'm also cutting out the sound from about 50 hertz and below. There's no significant frequency content, and I'm using this thing called Torque. It's doing a couple of things. It's emphasizing the sustain as opposed to the attack of the sound. And I'm pulling down the pitch a bit, a bit, 250 cents. Now this, smack attack. I suppose it's more natural without it. But I put it in clip mode. And you can see that it is clipping, so that's a form of distortion. And then most of the increase in low end is coming from this plug in here so I've got 12 decibels at 74 hertz so I must have decided by sweeping through that 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 was the fundamental frequency of that sound. When I turn that off it's much weaker, it's much more thump with that in. This channel here labelled low guitar, I've labelled it low guitar because that channel has got the boss pedal that adds a sub octave to it. So this one's high guitar. I think it is higher pitched and it is a bit brighter, but really that's just labeling to differentiate between this one's got some sub octave in it and this one doesn't. So I have EQ'd this a little bit. There's some sort of presence boost around nearly 2K, 1.5K. I've cut out a little bit of mid around 500 Hertz, but I've got rid of anything under 70 hertz but most of all added six decibels at 120 so that's the grunt of the sound and then i've got this uh chris lord aug multi-effects thing i'm adding a bit of compression there I'm adding some whole reverb and i'm adding some sub eq so i'm putting more emphasis on the lower end of that sound because it didn't print the tape all that well because of the limitations of the port 03 that i already mentioned so if I um, bypass the EQ at the beginning, there's the raw sound. I mean, I got a little bit lost with the guitars. I could have done almost nothing to them. They were sounding okay. As I uh, switch in here with this bypass control. Hopefully you can hear something positive happening when I put that in. But you know, pretty subtle changes really. The high guitar, I've done even less to that. I think I ended up bypassing the Chris Lord Aug multi effect. Didn't use it for this one. But I have added some low end. So if I navigate to a point where we can hear more of the low end of that. <laughs> I'm just adding a bit of low end, like I say, to compensate for that slightly thin sounding recording that I'm getting with this particular cheap Porta Studio. Vocals, channel down here, got a lot more effects on them. So the first of these is this Waves Vocal Rider effect. The way the Vocal Rider works, it's like having your own little personal uh, studio gimp that's going to sit with the fader and just ride the levels to pull some of the inconsistencies and level out of the vocals without actually using compression although I'm using compression as well to get a really uniform level of sound so I'll set fire to anything anything so long as it means you'll come running to me so hopefully there you could see this fader moving five or six decibels in response to the inconsistencies in my vocal delivery. And I'm using this SSL comp and I'm getting a lot of compression out of this. I think it's like over 12 decibels. I'll set fire to anything. Yeah, more like 16. If I turn that off. I'll set fire to anything. Anything. Even though the vocal writer is taking some of the inconsistencies and level out of that, there's still a lot of compression being added there. Adding a little bit of low mid and a little bit of presence using this EQ, but also getting rid of 
below 120 hertz and uh, above 6000 hertz just because it's such a middle focused microphone that I used there's no point in having those frequencies it's just um, unnecessary tape hiss I mean am I cheating there am I making it less tape like doing that mm, I don't know but anyway here's what it sounds like with and without I'll set fire to anything that was with I'll set fire to anything that's without you can hear a lot more hiss there I'll admit and then I'm adding some chamber reverb to that without this it's really dry sounding And when I stop the sound, it just cuts off immediately. But with this, I'll set fire to anything. You can hear it's got that tail off. And then if I um, solo all of these, so it's all coming through. I have quite a lot of stuff in the master bus, so I'll turn them on one by one. I've got this uh, two band EQ, and uh, that's attenuating from 13 kilohertz and above and 30 hertz and below. And that corresponds to the parts of the frequency range that cassette cannot reproduce anyway. So I'm just getting rid of some dead air, I keep on calling it. But I'm also attenuating the signal there by about six decibels. This is a pre-compressor adjustment so that I don't hit the compressor later in the chain too hard. So I won't turn that on and off because it's a good six decibel difference in sound so you'll hear the volume change more than you'll hear the change in character but then i've got this eq control um, where i'm adding some high end above four and a half k and then i've got a little dip around three and a half kilohertz and i'm leaving the low end alone so if i a b that here is with the eq off <laughs> Here it is on. So it seems like what I was going for there is to pull the vocals back a little bit and add a little bit more air to the drums. Now this Kramer HLS, it's got an EQ in it as well, but I'm just using the uh, compressor. So here it is out. And here it is in. So if you focus on the high end, you almost can't hear it. But if you listen to the low end, you're getting a, a, a bit more oomph to the sound with that engaged. And then I'm adding some plate reverb to everything. So this is the Abbey Rhodes plugin from Waves. I'll play a longer section without. And with. So it's kind of subtle, but I feel like uh, running everything through the same compressor and the same reverb, albeit at subtle levels, it glues the sound together a little bit. And then the only other plugins that I've got here are the L2 stereo. I think that's just maximizing the volume that I get in the output. I mean, I've also got the dithering on it. So if I want to export a 16 bit file, then that's compensating for any of the quantization errors and stuff you get. Is it quantization errors? I mean, anyway, look it up. Um, sometimes if you're in a 48 kilohertz environment and then you output a 44.1 kilohertz file, then you get some anomalies and this has got some dithering in there that compensates for that. I think that's the main thing, or I might be adding some level. <laughs> be adding some level he says it's got it's adding about six decibels to its loads louder here's it without
And again, with the effect on, it sounds less separate. It sounds like more like one cohesive thing. The only other plugin that's on there is this PAS equaliser. So it's just showing me whether the sound's in phase and what the frequency response is. <laughs> So I'm sitting at about minus 11 dB at uh, 65 kilohertz with the processed sound still lower than what I've got at say a thousand hertz. And uh, you know some recordings that I'm fond of that people like Steve Albini have recorded, you would see more of a um, curve like that. The low end would be louder in comparison to the high end, but then he's not recording a lot of like vicious lo-fi black metal, is he? Um, I think if we clear that and then I just go back to playing you the original, You know, here in that original file, um, 65 hertz is sitting at about minus 20 decibels. So the low end, we've got a good eight decibels louder with the high end staying at about where it is. So it's definitely a more low end heavy mix that I've achieved. Whether subjectively or objectively it's a bit recording, I don't know. As noted earlier, it's kind of easy to just lose perspective with this stuff. It's why I'm a fan of getting this stuff right during recording. I mean, like, Port 03, you know, it's kind of cool that I didn't have to think about, like, EQ and stuff while I was recording, but if I had been working with an 8-track or a more feature-rich 4-track, then I feel like I probably could have got a better sound. You know, let's say I had a drum machine where the there were individual outs and so the four or five different sounds on there. I could record to five different tracks of tape and then bounce that down to a stereo pair with an eight track recorder and then overdub the vocals and guitars over the top. Yeah, I could definitely get a better recording that way and could get the sort of balance that I'm getting within the digital audio workstation without doing any of it in the digital domain. I could do the, all of that in the box. I port a studio that had send effects for anything that was sounding a bit dry that I wanted to make wetter or send to a compressor. I could do all of that with an imported studio that way and I would tend to prefer to work that way just because of the pitfalls that I've outlined when we work in the digital domain. And that's not to say that there isn't stuff that you can only do in a digital audio workstation. Obviously, it's a more powerful tool, but it's a more time consuming tool. Uh, yeah, I just, I just like Porter Studios, I guess. Okay, so here's the uh, AB comparison section that I promised you earlier. I'm going to play you longer sections of the song. So anytime I, I've got audio coming out of the topmost file, that's the one that's red in colour, then that's the original file, that's the capture that came out of the stereo outputs of the port 03. Whereas this section down here is green in colour, that's the one that's a balance of the four wave stems captured using the Zoom recorder and then manipulated in the digital audio workstation. Okay, so let's start off with the introduction. vocals are pretty prominent, hearing more of the hi-hat than anything else. So if I mute that and then we listen to the same section in the enhanced version. I've put in this fade in. Yeah! 
So in that version, the kick drums are definitely a lot more audible. You can hear the snare drum if you pick it out. Not quite as loud as I would like it, but it's better. And the open hi-hat sound as opposed to the closed hi-hat sound is more audible. The vocals are a little bit less overbearing compared to the guitars, I would say. So we go to a different section. Here's the original song the one that came out of the port 03 with no digital enhancement. I am version. Again, much more kick drum, definitely more low end. I would say that I maybe slightly prefer the balance between the guitars and the original. Um, I feel that the guitar, which is on my left, is a bit more buried in the newer mix. So it's not like it's superior in every respect. And one more section to listen back to with both versions. Here's the original recording. <laughs> Fifi in my mouth. Best chocolates. <laughs> it's been a long day. What can I say? I'm off the wagon. I'm drinking Prosecco and eating a sugary shit. Those are the differences. I think there is an improvement there in the green version. Um, not everything's better. But, you know, that, them's the breaks. I guess what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that that original recording has some validity to it. It's not like by using hundreds of pounds worth of software on this recording, everything about it is improved. There is a case that you could make that the original recording is better, uh, that you know there will be people in the world who prefer that original version. So yeah, I mean, port a studio for the win and fuck the door, I guess is <laughs> my conclusion to that. Anyway, um, back to the original footage that I recorded. Uh, thanks for watching, thanks for sticking around to the end. It was kind of a game of two halves with the silly beginning and the unscripted babbling into a webcam for the second half. If you'd like to see more videos like this, if you're 
thinking about buying a Porter Studio or already own one and you want to learn how to fix it or think about different ways you can use it, please subscribe to the channel. Um, I do a lot of different content here, demos, repair tutorials, electronic stuff. Um, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.